Is your 3D printer suffering from ringing? Today we're going to attempt to make it a thing of the past by tuning acceleration. I think it's safe to say that everybody would like to improve their 3D printer quality, especially if they can do it for free. Fortunately, we have options in the slicer and firmware to achieve just this. Previously, I made a video on tuning your slicer settings. It covered things like calibrating your E-steps and how to print towers to tune retraction. In this video, we're going to build on that by tuning our acceleration and junction deviation. The need for this test came after I fitted the lightweight G5 Flex Extruder. And in that video, I did a speed test up to 200 millimeters per second. The results were inconclusive, as pointed out by one of my patrons, Martin Piringer, who said that I was printing too fast for the printer. Martin volunteers to facilitate a student robotics group called Viking Robotics 1989. They compete against much better resource competitors, pushing an anycubic Chiron to the limit in producing large structural parts from engineering filaments. To get the most out of his machine, he's done the hard yards and he has several freely available tutorials to share knowledge, one of which we are building on for this video. If you've got a few spare dollars and you'd like to help out Martin and his robotics team, the links are in the description. By the end of this video, we're gonna learn how to calculate our fastest possible extrusion, translate that into the fastest possible print speed, and then tune acceleration and junction deviation to find the right compromise between speed and ringing. The very first step we're going to do is use a program like Pronterface and enter an M503. This will spit out a range of values and we're going to copy and paste those to retain them. The first part of our process is to determine the fastest reliable extrusion speed of our printer. So we'll start with a really quick definition of speed as distance over time. On our 3D printer, the G1 moves that make up our G code dictate an F value for feed rate. And this example here, 3000 is in millimeters per minute. So if we divide by 60, our feed rate is actually 50 millimeters per second. Our initial aim is to work out how fast we can melt an extrude filament. This is the part where we're going to be following Martin's guide. And if you want to hear a thick Austrian accent, he's also got a lengthy video included. For this video, I've converted this guide to an Excel spreadsheet, which you can access from the video description. Step one is to clear debris from the hop gear, bring up the nozzle to normal printing temperature, and then load up some filament. We're going to enter G91. And this sets the positioning to relative, so every time we type in 50, it adds another 50 millimeters. Next up, we're going to type in G1 E50 F120, which will extrude 50 millimeters of filament at 120 millimeters per minute, which is 2 millimeters per second. Make sure you're nearby the printer so you can expect the extrusion closely. Assuming this was successful, we're going to repeat the command except this time up the feed rate to 180 or 3 millimeters per second. We're going to keep on manually extruding filament, upping the feed rate until we eventually hit the limit. So how do you know when you reach the limit? Well, for me, there was two signs. The first was inconsistent filament width, as shown here where it goes from skinny to thick and skinny again. The second was by watching and listening to the extruder and it started to struggle and then click once it reached the limit. On this printer, the clicking was consistent at a feed rate of 480. So I backed off 20 at a time until I found a safe value of 420. Back on the spreadsheet, we're up to step four and we enter two values. Firstly, the width of our filament, which for most people is 1.75. And secondly, our reliable value, which in my case was 420. The spreadsheet will now calculate our maximum volume of filament that can be extruded per second, in this case, 16.8 millimeters cubed per second. And this is just simple maths based on the area of the filament times the length of the filament extruded. I perform this test on a range of my printers and the results are actually pretty interesting. Some points of interest that if you raise your temperature, your maximum flow rate will increase as well. The Homera Plus Volcano is pretty beastly, but that's partially because there's a larger nozzle and my modified Ender 3 comfortably outperforms the standard Ender 3 for this test. Let's continue on the spreadsheet with step five. We need two settings from our slicer. The first is our layer height, which in Simplify 3D is the primary layer height on the layer tab 
and in Cura, if we search for layer, it's also called layer height. The second value we need is the extrusion or line width that our slicer is aiming for. In Simplify 3D, it's extrusion width, and whether you've got it set to auto or manual, it's the number in this box. And in Cura, if you search for line, it's the top value called line width. You're then going to type in those two values into the next set of yellow boxes. The final calculation converts the volume of the filament pre-extrusion to the much smaller volume of the extruded layer line after it comes out of the nozzle. The number that's been spat out for my example is 175 millimeters per second. And this basically means that 175 millimeters per second is the fastest we can move the print head with the extruder being able to keep up. And with this final number, we've finished step two, so we'll head back to our slicer. In Simplify 3D, we can now set our default printing speed with the value from the spreadsheet. I don't feel the need to have 175 millimeters per second. I'm gonna add in a bit of safety margin and instead set mine to 150. In Cura, if we type in speed and head to the speed section, we can type in our desired value as well. You can see as per Simplify 3D, this is just a base speed and it's gonna be slowed down for certain parts of the model, such as the outside perimeters. We have our target top speed, so it's now time for step three to tune the acceleration to maintain that speed, but minimize ringing. Acceleration is the change in speed over a time period. And if we relate this to a car, we know that it can't get from A to B at a constant speed. Instead, there'll be a period of acceleration and then cruising at top speed and then deceleration to stop. Acceleration is a change in speed over time, therefore it's distance over time over time. In the firmware, we have a max print acceleration for each axis, just like the maximum feed rate. But then we have an actual acceleration value, which is applied to all G1 G code moves. The P value for print is applied to all of our G1 moves with an E value, and that's the one we're most concerned with. And then there's R for retraction moves and T for travel moves where no plastic is coming out. We can retrieve the saved values for all of this in the firmware from our M503 output. For example, on the X1, the X and Y limits are 2000, but the actual acceleration for print moves is only set to 800. To test various acceleration values, we're going to print a tower that compares them back to back. This is a more advanced evolution of a previous design I had, designed to provoke ringing. From the top, it's got 200 millimeter lengths for X and Y, some 90 degree turns, a shallow curve, as well as quite a tight turn. There's exported versions available on Thingiverse, but if you did want to edit it and have an Onshape account, it's all driven by these variables here. Simply change your number and the object will regenerate with your new setting in place. My sides are only 100 millimeters long, which previously I would have thought was too short to hit top speed, but then I found this excellent calculator on the Prusa printers blog. You can see I've put in 100 millimeters as a length, the standard Ender 3 acceleration of 500, which is fairly conservative, and you can see even with a very high speed of 150 millimeters per second, for the first 20 odd mils, it's gonna be accelerating, have a steady period of top speed before it decelerates for the final part of the extrusion. This is a really handy tool that changes in real time as you update the numbers, and will show you just how long each extrusion is at full speed with a range of settings. It's worth noting that if your acceleration is too slow, there's no blue line, which means it never reaches top speed. Here's how I recommend slicing this object. You should set your infill to zero, your external shells to only two, and your top and bottom solid layers to zero. Depending on the adhesion of your print bed, you can add a brim to help it stick. After slicing, it should look just like this. So export the G-code file ready for editing. We're now going to pick some values either side of the M204 P value already set in the printer. We're going to edit the G-code to get it to test a range of different acceleration values. I decided to go half for the first segment, factory for the second, and then crease quite high every segment after that. In your favorite text editor, and I recommend Notepad++, you're gonna open your G-code file and scroll down until you see where the first layer starts. On Simplify 3D, this is labeled with a comment layer one and then a Z value. On Cura, we have a comment saying layer zero. The first thing we're gonna do is temporarily up our acceleration limits so they don't interfere with the test. I'm gonna enter M201, X3000, Y3000. 
After that, I'm going to set the first of my acceleration values. M204, P400, which represents half of the factory value. We're now going to copy this line, control F and search for Z equals five. For a file generated in Cura, it's going to be exactly the same, except we're going to search for Z and then the number we want with no gap. We can enter a new line after this comment and this time up our acceleration, I'm going to go for the factory value of 800. And now we repeat this process, searching for 10, then 15, then 20, and upping the M204P value to whatever we decided beforehand. When we're done, we save the G code and send it to the printer. When printing this, you want a nice dark shiny filament as it will show off the imperfections in the surface more clearly. The acceleration changes the speed in a subtle way, but there should be a marked difference between what happens on the first segment versus what happens near the end of the print. And here are my results for the Artillery 3D X1. For most of these features, the best results are on either the second or third band, which means the factory acceleration is actually pretty close. Remember that the base speed is 150 millimeters per second, and as you can see on those long walls, we're hitting that without any issues. Decide your favorite value based on your tolerance for accepting ringing. If you really wanted to fine tune, you could rerun the test, editing the G code to have a much finer range of M204P values to test. Once you've got a value you're happy with, we can now save it permanently to the printer. Back in Printerface, we're going to enter M204P and then your final value. After that, we'll store it to the EEPROM with M500 and do an M503 to double check that it's been stored. We're on to our final step and that's tuning jerk or junction deviation. Recently in Marlin 2.0, junction deviation became the default rather than the classic jerk. If you want to know what your printer is running in your M503 results, look for the M205 section. If a J value is listed, you're running junction deviation. If there's X, Y, Z and E, you're running classic jerk. I just updated the firmware on the X1 so it had junction deviation with a stock value of 0.03. So what is junction deviation? Marlin Firmware links to this detailed article explaining junction deviation. I'll link it in the description in case you'd like to read it properly. For this video, we're going to explain it much simpler. If you remember back in our acceleration example, we started with a speed of zero and then decelerated to a standing stop once again. For solid infill, where the nozzle has to turn and go back the direction it came from, this makes some sense. For a really tight corner, it's intuitive that you'll have to slow down quite a bit to be able to turn properly. But what about a 90 degree bend? We don't have to slow down to a complete standstill to be able to go around the corner. And for a really shallow curve, we would expect to not really have to slow down much at all. Consider the many straight segments that make up a circle. We want these to flow continuously, not stop and stutter for each straight segment that makes up the arc. We want a smart cornering speed depending on the angle. Therefore, the junction deviation number, as this second article explains, dictates how much the printer will slow down when encountering corners by looking at the sharpness of the corner as well as the acceleration value. If the number is too small, it'll slow down to the point of leaving blobs. And if the number is too high, quartering will be so fast that we introduce ringing. The good news is we can use exactly the same test piece to set up our junction deviation. I chose a range of values either side of 0.03 and if you were doing this with jerk you would choose a range of values but with x and y. We can recycle our G code from earlier searching for the M204s and replacing them with M205s. We can then print with the modified G code and then inspect our finished part. Because we've already tuned the acceleration, this one is a lot harder to see the difference between the graduations. One thing I found interesting were these little bumps that lined up with the gap in the X's. I guess it was hitting that corner a lot faster when it didn't have to slow down for the X's. The quality didn't seem to suffer the higher up the tower, so therefore I elected to stick with the upper value of 0.06. To save our final value for junction deviation, we do M205J and then the value. Jerk would be similar, except with an X and Y value. We now do M500 to store to EEPROM and M503 to verify that everything worked correctly. 
So that's the tutorial over, but there's still some important things to consider. I tried to print a Benchy at max speed with a room fan pointing to it to make sure it would cool sufficiently. The X1 uses an MKS TFT, which runs prints over a serial connection, just like Octoprint. Unfortunately, that meant I ran into buffering problems, with the print pausing many times and leaving these ugly blobs all over the object. It's impossible to tell how this Benchy was going to turn out, but considering the base speed was 150 millimeters per second, I think it looked promising. It's a reminder of our second point, that sometimes a theoretical top speed can't be reached because of other limiting factors in the chain. Although I tuned my ringing towards the maximum speed possible, the techniques to tune the acceleration that you saw in this video applies to slower feed rates as well. If you are tuning for max speed, keep in mind that the maximum speed will depend on the type of filament the color of filament, the brand of filament, and other variables. So make sure you leave in a sufficient margin for safety. It's also worth noting that some filaments such as nylons might have a maximum feed rate they recommend to ensure good layer adhesion. One feature in Marlin that's definitely worth enabling is S-curve acceleration. Its job is to stop rigid acceleration up to top speed instead smoothing out the process with a Bezier curve. If you search for acceleration in Cura, you can tick a box and then you'll see many options for adjusting the acceleration depending on the print feature. This means you could have it much higher for infill, but lower on outer perimeters where you want to see good results. My last tip is that when you're doing any of these test prints, your outer perimeter will always be printed slower than the inner perimeter. So make sure you inspect the inside and outside when making your judgments. That brings us to the end of this one. Thanks again to Martin and his tutorial that I based this on. Remember that if you would like to donate, the links are in the description. If you've got any thoughts on this process, please leave it down below in the comments. Thank you so much for watching and until next time, happy 3D printing. G'day, it's Michael again. If you liked the video, then please click like. If you want to see more content like this in future, click subscribe and make sure you click on the bell to receive every notification. If you really want to support the channel and see exclusive content, become a patron. Visit my Patreon page. See you next time.